welcome to the Politics and Media Show with me, John Rees. The government's plans to reform the legal aid system suffered three fresh blows last Wednesday in the House of Lords when peers voted in favour of a number of amendments to the Justice Secretary Ken Clark's bill. The amendments to the Legal Aid, Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Bill will allow legal aid to be continued for those challenging cuts in their benefit, appealing to a higher court and requiring expert reports in clinical negligence cases. The government had wanted to save $350 million from the Ministry of Justice's $8.9 billion budget by 2015, though denying state funding for cases involving immigration, domestic violence, social housing, medical negligence and welfare. But the amendments, as well as a raft of earlier ones, have dealt those plans a major blow. Before I introduce this week's guest, let's take a look at some of the House of Lords debate on the legal aid reform last week. My Lords, if the Government's proposals succeed, it will mean that family legal aid will only be allowed where domestic violence is shown by the existence of an injunction or criminal conviction, if the victim is subject to a multi-agency risk assessment conference, a MARIC, which basically means is at risk of grievous bodily harm or death, or where the violence has been found as a fact in the family courts, and most of this evidence has to be obtained in the last 12 months. The simple truth, my lords, is that if the current proposal is brought into force, genuine victims are going to be excluded from obtaining the help and support that they desperately need to bring themselves and their children into a place of safety. In its current proposed terms, a police officer's statement that he or she believes domestic violence is present will not be enough evidence to gain the victim legal aid. Neither, my lords, will a medical certificate from a general practitioner nor confirmation from social services. None of that, my lords, will do. The government, I know very well, recognises the seriousness of the impact of domestic violence, which, as we all know, is a serious scourge in family life. I think perhaps it's worth just remembering it's also not only a serious scourge for the victim, there are other victims, because so many of these women, and a few men, and there certainly are some men who are victims, uh, have children. And the children are those who probably suffer most, not only short term, but long term in their ability to cope with life. And consequently, if the women, and mainly the women, are unable to get to court with the appropriate help, it is not only they who suffer, it is also the children. Above all, uh, I think we need to realise one of the reasons that action is not taken at the moment in areas where uh, it should have been, and that is because the law on things like stalking uh, are totally out of date. And what we're beginning to see, of course, with new media is processes by which really abhorrent forms of abuse against women can be taking place uh, and nobody has the necessary uh, legal, um, well, the law in place in which to deal with this situation. Let me make it clear from the very start that this government is absolutely committed uh, to supporting action against uh, domestic violence and supporting the victims of domestic violence whether through legal aid funding or through other means. And I don't think it serves the interests of those suffering from domestic violence uh, to suggest uh, otherwise. Our record is a good one. We have provided over 28 million of stable funding until 2015 for specialist local domestic and sexual violence support services and are providing 900,000 to support national domestic violence helplines and stalking helplines. In the studio to discuss this with me is Lord Phillips of Sudbury, a Liberal Democrat peer and a lawyer. Uh, welcome to the show. We also have Andrew Slaughter, the Labour Shadow Justice Minister. And we have Johnny Mulligan of Sound Off for Justice, which is a campaigning organisation opposed to proposed government cuts in legal aid. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, Lord Phillips first. So it's been a more dramatic week than most in the Lords, although it's had a few recently. <laughs> um, what's your position on the debate? How do you think it's, uh, it's going? Well, I think it's going the right way, and I think it's going well. 
the Liberal Democrats, as part of the junior part of the coalition, have felt very uncomfortable with um, quite a lot of what's in the bill, to be frank. Um, although, having said that, you've got the... If you, if you omit to put this in context, then you will never understand what's going on in the Lords and the Commons. Uh, and that is, as we think, uh, an economic crisis where we have to maintain the credibility of sterling uh, in order to avoid uh, this country paying vastly more in, in interest rates on its huge national debt. And I don't think there's any dispute about that. But when it comes down to actual cuts, how to make those huge savings, it is very painful. And I've spent my legal life, and I've been in the law more than 50 years, protecting and advancing legal aid. I set up a charity called the Legal Action Group with three other guys and another charity called Citizen, Citizenship Foundation. So it's very painful because access to the law is a fundamental human right for us to pass lots and lots of laws to benefit poor people and then deny them the access to those rights is, is a form of cynicism. So, but, having said all that, uh, we've had a number of very significant changes and I think there are more to come. Mm. Uh, Andrew, um, it looks as if, though, that the, the, the economics don't quite stack up with the bill anyway, that it wouldn't save the money that uh, it said it would. Is that your view? No, I mean, the, this is a very serious uh, bill. It, if it goes through, it will completely change the ability of people on lower middle income to get access to justice in this country. It's a fundamental unwinding of the 70 years we've had of uh, equal access to justice or an attempt to get to there. That's how serious it is. It tends to get a bit overshadowed by the health bill and welfare benefit and things like that. But particularly for uh, vulnerable people, for women, for children, for minority groups who rely disproportionately, for whatever reason, um, uh, partly because of socioeconomic reasons, partly for language reasons, on legal aid, law centres, citizens' advice bureaus. Most of that service in most areas will be cut away by this bill. That's how serious it is. I took the bill through the Commons. The interesting thing about listening to Lord Phillips is I have heard those arguments coming not just from Labour peers and from organisations like uh, Johnny's and practitioners um, uh, and pressure groups, but I did hear them from uh, Lib Dems and even some Tory MPs, but we lost every vote because they were whipped into line. Now, I'm afraid that's what's happened in the House of Lords as well. And uh, I think Lord Phillips' views on this, and I know he abstained on some of the votes, but almost and every... Voted against al them. And voted against <laughs> them. But almost every <coughs> Liberal Democrat peer, the same people who claim that they're in favour of access to justice, and almost every Tory uh, peer, with one or two honourable exceptions, voted to cut legal aid. And the only reason we're winning at the moment is because the Labour peers and the non-aligned peers, the sort of people you heard in your clip, very senior people um, who, who are not party political, but who understand <coughs> the cuts here. So that's where we are. The big issue for me after Easter, when it comes back into the Commons, is will the government try to reverse these gains that we've made? Will they try and go ahead with the cuts in legal aid? Well, Lord Fitz, I'll give you a, a moment to respond to that in a second. But first of all, let me bring um, Johnny Mulligan in. Um, just let me bring you back to the, the financial question, because as Lord Phillips said, that's at the heart of the, of, of the government's case. Um, is it your organisation's view that, in actual fact, it wouldn't save the money in any case, this legislation? Yeah, I think the financial arguments are a complete deception. They're not true. Uh, no savings can be achieved for the taxpayer. We carried out a study with King's College on three areas of scope, which include health, welfare, social security. It showed that the government would have knock-on costs of $129 million, and the bill overall would possibly cost the taxpayer $379 million. So the government target is $350 million. Immediately that's gone away with. You have organisations like the Taxpayers' Alliance who said there is no savings to be made. The fact is as well, when the government brought this bill to Parliament, it had 15 admissions that they have no evidence for savings, no evidence, you know, where these problems will go. And fundamentally, and the major flaw that this government has is, you have people who are helped by the legal aid budget. Where do these people go? They don't disappear. You know, they don't go somewhere else. <clears throat> They're still in our society, and if you don't deal with the small problems the legal aid budget deals with, they become 
big problems, mm -hmm. increased criminality and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I just had to, I, I read a report on the way here that the effect just of the legal aid cuts is a 60% cut in the budget for Citizens Advice Bureau law centres in London, but it's the same <coughs> in the rest of the country. <coughs> but that's, on top of that, you've got all the cuts in local government funding and other things. Even though the government says we will preserve certain small areas of legal aid, the reality is there will not be enough money in the system for any of these organisations to sustain themselves. So we are actually looking at a desert of advice. Well, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't actually agree with that because um, I had my name to an amendment which we argued last week uh, and which had support across the House, um, namely to at least ensure that CABs and law centres and independent advice centres, and there are about um, 160 law centres and advice centres, and there's about 500 CABs with specialist advisors. These are absolutely critical, and if funding for those goes, then I absolutely accept there will be chaos. But for, the problem for, you for, have let me just finish the yeah. point. There will be chaos for poor, poorer people, but the government, in the end of the debate last week, Lord McNally made a commitment to provide the continuing funding at a level which would not see that carnage occur. And so we now need to see the colour of his money, but um, I have no doubt we will. And that has been a major, major change by the government. Let me just bring, there's a, there's a statement that Lord McNally made here. He said that um, he argued that difficult decisions had to be made, um, et cetera, et cetera, which is an argument we've heard from a number of government ministers. He said, this isn't a debate about who cares most. It's about whether the House is willing to take the tough decisions about our economic situation or whether it's simply going to push the problem down the corridor to the Commons because the Commons will have to take those decisions whether or not we make them here. Um, but, but actually, that's not quite what's happening, is it? Because the, the, the debates in the Lords are having an impact on this bill. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think... They are having an impact. I think what you hear a lot about is, well, when it goes back to the Commons, they'll use financial privilege and they'll just overturn it. You see MPs in the Commons, such as Liz Truss, Matt Hancock, who are you know, very ill-informed. They sit on the bill committee or they're close to it. And the threat is it goes back to the Commons, you use financial privilege, and all the wins in the Lords are overdone with. Do you think that um, I think there's a threat of it. I think... I fear that, I obviously hope, and we will argue as best we can, to keep the improvements. The Lords have only improved the bill to some extent, but they're significant areas. We would hope to at least keep them. But precedent on the Welfare Benefits Bill and indeed the Health Bill suggests that the government will try and ride roughshod over the Lords' decision. I don't have the same confidence, Lord Phillips, in that the advice centre will be saved. Yeah. Two of the four main advice centres in my constituency have already closed because yeah. of cuts that have happened, and many more are threatened. And indeed, the report I was reading on the way here was done by London uh, CAB. But even if that first level of help, i.e. the people who uh, go in, walk into their CAB and say, can you help me with this housing problem or employment problem, even if that was protected in some way, the access to the courts, yeah. which is what we're talking about, about justice, about fairness, that's definitely going. Well, now, the Lords have tried to reverse that on, for example, welfare benefits. But this is how ridiculous some of the government's claims are. Mm. They say, we will not only not give you uh, first stage advice, we will not give you advice on appeal. So they are expecting people, and many people will say on welfare benefits, are disabled people, they're people with low literacy skills, or second language uh, uh, is an issue for them. And they are being asked to com compel complex appeals on points of law to higher courts. Well, that clearly yeah. is a nonsense. I mean, I, I agree with that. It's self-defeating, and, mm. it, and, it, and it feeds into the point about the sort of downstream costs mm. uh, of this uh, will be very substantial. And, and, and I think another reason why I don't think they'll use financial privilege is that I think they've taken on board some of the King's College research, etc. And I would be very surprised were they to do that. If they did it, there, there would be a rumpus... To, mm -hmm. Just let me, uh, to, before we get, get, get any more into the detail of this, I just want to ask about the political impact of the, of the debates, because there clearly has been at the Lib Dems conference and it's voted uh, against, uh, against this measure. Do you think this is more likely to get the government to, to give ground, the fact that... Yes, what I do, because um, we are, as I repeat, very much the junior partner in the coalition, but they have to keep us happy to some extent. I... I really do think that there's a lot of pressure feeding in to the coalition through uh, the Lib Dem benches. And 
you know, uh, Andy Slaughter made the point about we all troop through the lobbies. Well, that's not very different from what you lot do down 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 your end. It tend to be rather more uh, in servitude to the whips than we are. A lot of lot of Lib Dem peers have abstained. Uh, quite a few have have voted against uh, some of these measures and and led to defeats. Uh, and so, I think there's still a lot to play for. Uh, I mean, I'm full of foreboding still, but I repeat. Uh, all the cuts that are being made are agonising. Um, this is more agonising for me because I'm a lifelong su supporter of legal aid and I, and I do think some things are more fundamental than others. But then you look at health and education and defence and who's the, So it's a, it's a sort of a situation. Let me bring Johnny in first and then, uh, and then Andrew. You've talked about the pressure of the Lib Dems. So last week you admitted yourself that you'd, you know, stood aside on some of the votes, and you'd against. vote on some. But yeah. will you now, like last week, there was one key vote on clinical negligence, which was lost by six votes. Yeah. Will you now? Do you think from that pressure, will I see you voting against the government more this week? Will you vote against the Jackson reforms, and will some of your Lib Dem, Dem colleagues follow well, you on that? I won't, because actually I have a. I'm um, much more um, embattled in my own mind about the whole of the contingency fee setup, and I tend to support the Jackson reforms. I see the counter argument. I have got an amendment down which would uh, require the government to have a complete, deep review by an independent person uh, within a year of the amazingly skewed and complex world of clinical negligence. I had a case last week mentioned to me from the South Wales NHS where uh, a man recovered £4,500 damages for uh, some negligence. The costs in, in lawyers uh, and insurance costs £98,000. This is a world out of control. But the, the just Jackson, because I, 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 just, just let me bring you back to the broad mm, political point. Do you yeah. think that the... The debates, uh, uh, cumulatively, really, over the health service and now over yeah. legal aid, are are going to impact on the government through the decisions at the Lib Dem conference. Well, they uh, they should do, and I doubt that they will do. Uh, I, I disagree with Lord Phillips's two points. The point on finance. A, I agree with Johnny that actually the, these cuts in legal aid will cost more than they save. So you have to ask about the motivation for it. And the motivation is about restricting access to justice. And that's no. something which the Liberal Democrats would, ought, ought to uh, be on the right side of the argument on, even if the Conservatives aren't. But the, if they wanted to look for cuts in legal aid system, you'd look for on the criminal side for, say, senior barristers earning six or seven figure sums. So let's put the financial argument on one side. The political argument uh, is this. The Lib Dems may only be a small part of the coalition, but they're essential. If they voted against, this bill would not get through. And I'm afraid to correct Lord Phillips, I looked at the voting figures, and they were slightly different in each vote, but typically you were having 60 Lib Dem peers voting with the, with the Conservatives and two or three voting against. I appreciate some, some may well have abstained, 20. but, but you know, we won those votes in spite of the Lib Dems, not because of them. And they, they cannot continue. Eventually the party must fracture because you cannot have scenes like we had last weekend where the leadership and the parliamentary side of it goes and says, government is good for you, the coalition is good for you. And the rank and file say, we don't like the health bill, we don't like the legal aid cuts. Mm. That, that's an unsustainable position. Just let me, add, I mean, uh, Lord Phillips, you were objecting when Andy Slaughter was saying there that there's an ideological thing. But there, there is an ideological difference in the whole tradition of the Liberal Democrats who have been, you know, known as a pro-civil liberties organisation yep. and the Tory party, which yep. isn't. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's true. Uh, although, don't ignore a very significant slice of Tories in Lords and Commons who feel as strongly about this as, as we do on this panel. Uh, There's no good feeling strong about it. No, you now but, need to vote I, against I know, it. I know what you say, but uh, A, there has to be some discipline within a coalition and, and you have to take some unpalatable medicine, number one, uh, uh, and there's a limit to that, and that's why the Lords are rather important, because the limits in the Lords are much lower, the hurdles much lower in the Lords and in the Commons. Uh, and secondly, I come back to it, I mean, the, the Labour, in your last m mm. manifesto, you were talking about cutting legal aid. So this isn't, uh, uh, this isn't a doctrinal mm. difference between the parties. The issue is, 
How necessary are these cuts in relation to cuts as a whole? But these cuts are not going to work, number one. Number well, two, number you, two you keep I think there is, that. I, there is I think a there trend. Is, there is, there it is, is arguable. Well, there's not really, because the only evidence is the King's College report. The government and the MOJ don't have any evidence. There's a black hole yeah, I know, in the I, MOJ I know accounts, I know where the permanent secretary of the MOJ was asked by the Public Accounts Committee, can you give us the evidence of savings? Yep. And he said, I will not have my accounts ready till 2015. Yep. So you're essentially, the government is trying to say, we'll make a saving of $350 million mm -hmm. when they don't know where their own budgets are. They've got a black hole of 1.6 billion. On your second point about Lib Dems, there's a trend that went on on the Commons as well, that we had Alan Beath, we had Tom Brake, with all these Lib Dems talking a good game with us, saying we will help you. When it came to the vote, they did nothing. That's what happens in the Commons. Well, it's yeah. kind of happened okay, in the Lords uh, as well. Gentlemen, you know. when did, when uh, did you with, with that, and the, and the with when that did you thought, I resigned uh, over oh, disagreeing well. with my party. I resigned well, from my humble ministerial position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, gentlemen, with that uh, thought about um, <laughs> what exactly happens in the Commons and how whipped we are, uh, we're going to have to leave this discussion. Thank you all for being uh, part of it, and uh, we'll be back in uh, the second half of this programme uh, to discuss what makes Bradford British. The uh, uh, the Channel File documentary that's been showing and it's caused some of a stir. So join us for the second half. Welcome back to the Politics and Media Show. A Channel 4 documentary focusing on racial diversity in Bradford has been criticised by community leaders. Make Bradford British has put people from a range of different backgrounds together to see if they can find common ground on what makes them British. But the show, which is halfway through a four-part series, has been criticised by community leaders who say that the city has been unfairly targeted. Bradford Council leader Ian Greenwood complained that he was fed up with TV programmes portraying Bradford negatively and being deeply segregated. Channel 4 said it aimed to overcome stereotypes and preconceptions. Now, before I introduce our guests, let's take a look at the Channel 4 trailer for the programme. Is multicultural Britain in trouble? You know, as a community, you feel threatened. I would walk around that alley at night on my own. With Bradford being one of the UK's most segregated cities. It's a ticking time bomb. Thursday at nine, the people of Bradford are about to see just how British they really are. Question one. As they sit the government citizenship test. I don't understand the question. And eight of them move in together. It's compulsory to pray five times a day. Stay your ass here. But can people of different races? How can somebody help the colour of their skin? Different religions. Mosque and that. I thought they were like terrorist centres. And different cultures. She looks beautiful, but she don't fit in with us. Oh, where can I ever be seen as being British? Really live together. It's about being more tolerant of each other. And define what it means. We've integrated because we've lived with each other. To be British. It's in my heart. Well, with me to discuss the show and the issue it raises around Britishness and multiculturalism is Julian Bond of the Christian Muslim Forum. Welcome to the show. And on the phone we have Zulfi Karim, General Secretary of the Bradford Council of Mosques. Welcome, Zulfi. Um, now, uh, what do you think ab about this? Is this cheap sensationalism masquerading as serious journalism or has it actually got something serious to say? I think there were some sens sensationalist aspects to it, especially in the episode which was on last week, <clears throat> which showed the confrontation in the pub between a guy from Bradford and the young Muslim woman. But the experiment itself does highlight some of the issues and shows people working through them and being transformed in the process, which is a good thing. Mm. Uh, Zulfi, uh, welcome to the programme. Uh, what's your take on this? Is it going to help matters in Bradford or hinder them? Uh, two points, first of all. Um, I think the title, Make Bradford British, is, is probably not ideal. Um, I don't think Bradford is segregated as uh, the title suggests. So the title probably uh, wasn't incorrect. But the programme and the contents of the programme were, in, in, in broad terms, Pretty accurate. That is really where, where, where society is currently. 
So do you think that this whole business, though, about segregation is, uh, is overstated? Because isn't it the case that there have always been immigrant communities that have come to this country? They've always gathered in the first generation or second generation in particular localities, and then they've always dispersed out into the general population. So uh, what's the issue here? The last 40 years uh, for me while I've been um, in, in this country, I was actually born and bred in Bradford, so I've spent all my life here. And, and this, is not, this is not unique, and, and it's not a new issue. This, these issues, as far as communities living in isolation, some choose to live in harmony, come together, share cultures, share religions, where, where others choose not to and want to live in isolation. Uh, so I don't think that's anything new. Uh, yes, it has been sensationalised uh, by, by the media uh, on, on both sides, uh, but actually the common ground where the work that the Christians or the Muslims are doing in the community, this is nothing new. Mm, Julian, well, what do you reckon about it? Because surely this is a historical pattern and, uh, and to speak of it as if it's a kind of unique or uniquely dangerous moment now is to misunderstand our past, isn't it? It's also one-sided because people talk about the communities which are segregated and what is often not said is how the people who were there originally have moved out and have chosen to move out because they're unhappy with the way in which their neighbourhood is changing. And the whole of society needs to take responsibility for the makeup and the shape of society and the way it's turned out. And if people were more comfortable with each other, then we would get less segregation. Mm -hmm. And in order to be more comfortable, then people need to welcome their neighbours, get to know them, and build the community together, build friendships, build good relationships. That is the, the antidote for segregation. Mm. And uh, when we talk about British society, it's not as if British society is the most segregated society uh, in the world. I mean, if you look at America, it's, it's vastly more uh, segregated. You might make the same case even about, uh, even about France. So, in a way, what's British is the degree of integration. That's right, and, and there is more of it in some places in the country. So here in, in London, there's much more of a mix. But if you go to other towns and cities, there is um, a sort of monoculture where the inhabitants are, are mainly white. And then you have other places where there are particular wards which are predominantly one ethnic or cultural group. And it's highlighted in some of these places. And the, the overall country is not uniformly mixed. So it's more of an issue in some places. Mm. And some places have handled it well, like Leicester, for example but also Bradford, um, where the Queen, the Queen was in Leicester last week and there was a, a celebration in the cathedral of how well the inhabitants of Leicester get on with each other and all goods interfaith and intercultural mixes. But there are many good stories to come from Bradford also. Mm. I mean, Zulfi, what do you think about that point? I mean, you know, to... to to compare Britain and America, I mean, there's very little of the sort of uh, incredible degree of segregation that you get in the United States in, in anywhere in Britain, really, is there? Never mind about in Bradford. I think the question, really, uh, which, which comes out from this programme is, is, is what is Britishness? And, and, and for me, um, if we have a look at this test that uh, has been online, um, even that the government are saying that this test is not fit for purpose. Uh, 70, 80 percent of all those that uh, that got involved actually failed the test, uh, and I myself failed the test. Mm, yeah, um, I failed it when so, I took it. Absolutely. So, so I'm actually not very clear of 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 what the the argument about Britishness is, and what does it mean to be British. Uh, if you have a look at currently, you know, Scotland wants to be independent. Mm. Um, you know, probably Wales would as well if it had the choice. Um, so what is it to be British? We're talking about giving local authorities and, 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 and local parishes their own kind of power to, to control their areas when it comes to planning um, and various other things. So, so how British are we and what does it mean to be British? Just because you happen to 
you know, be of a particular coloured skin or of a particular religion, does that make you less British than, than, than the indigenous population? And, and what is Britishness? I think for me, that is what the, the question that's begging at the moment is, can somebody explain to me what it is to be British? Mm. Well, Julian, that's a, that's a very good question, isn't it? Because, I mean, uh, one answer to that question might be um, that it's whatever um, the people who happen to inhabit a particular patch of land are, are doing at a particular moment, and that references to what, ha what has happened in the past may or may not uh, be, be relevant. I mean, if we go far back, then I suppose we could say that bear baiting was a traditional British sport, but most people don't really take the view that if you aren't a bear baiter, you aren't British any longer. Mm. So, so it's, it, it's, it's a movable feast, isn't it? Yes, and I don't think the programme really answered what it is to be British. And from the, the results of the, the citizenship test, one indicator of being British is failing the test, as nearly everybody did on the programme and on the Channel 4 website. And I failed it myself. I scored 50%, and here mm. we are. You did better than me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think there was a hope being expressed in the programme about what Britishness was, which is everybody getting on together and respecting and valuing each other's different religious and cultural traditions. And part of what being British is, is to be an immigrant, to be an Angle or a Saxon or a Jute or a Norman or a Viking or a Pakistani. Mm. And we are a nation of immigrants mm. and very diverse. Mm. Zulfi, do you think there's something wrong with the format here as well? Because it's kind of, you know, half Big Brother and half documentary. And do you think you can really get at uh, anything sort of serious about this debate through that format? Uh, I think the, the overall the format, yes, was a you know a take on Big Brother, uh, but that it, that it works. It, it gets audiences and it gets people talking. And you know, if you have a look at the debate on Twitter and the rest of it, you know, it, it's still out there and uh, people are very much uh, clued in because I think this is what today's generation that are media savvy, that are very much into television, reality, celebrity lifestyle. This is you know, what they're after. And as far as the programme makers are concerned, you know, they're a production company, they do this for a living, they were commissioned by Channel 4 to make intriguing television and something that's going to create a debate, and they've done that, so credit to them. Um, I think what it is now is for, for communities, like if you, if you look at the churches now in Bradford and the mosques and people, the community leaders now, both from, you know, Christian, Muslim and, you know, Bradford churches for dialogue, the council for mosques, they're always the ones that are left holding the baby or picking up the pieces on what, what is it that we need to do. And the programme makers are going to walk away from this. And, you know, there, there is no uh, kind of follow-on or no return to this. Um, but for me, the big question is, the politicians and you know what are the politicians going to do about this if they have now highlighted a particular issue happens to be in Bradford but actually I see this issue in majority of all major cities in the UK this program could have been shot in in, in Bristol in Birmingham in in Toxteth anywhere and these issues do exist in most, uh, sorry, in most communities and possibly countries where there is immigrants that have moved into an area and that are trying to make home. I think the interesting point here for me now is we have moved on. You know, 50, 70, 100 years of immigrants in, in, in this country. This is not a new debate. These immigrants are not just coming in for the first time. We are talking now third, fourth generation. I think what needs to change is our attitude towards multiculturalism. And what also needs to happen, which unfortunately is still not happening, and I think for me this is the crux of the problem, is educating the young children in schools how they should live together and what it is to be together. And the big question, we had a debate at the Council for Most last week, straight after the programme, and, and the word that came out was tolerance and how tolerant are we of each other in society. Mm. Julian, I mean, you know, Zulfi makes the case that the, the programme works in a sort of television mm. sense, 
But is it working in, in any more fundamental sense in terms of uh, accurately reflecting the causes of the problems or, or pointing their way towards solutions? Because it's entirely based on individual interaction. That's what's making it television. That's what the sort of big brother element of it is. But we all know if you were to look at any of these questions seriously, you have to look at things that can't be personalised. You have to look at the housing market. You have to look at welfare provision. You have to look at unemployment. You have to look at poverty. And those things just will never register in a format like this. No, but when you look at society and communities, what I think we need to look at is relationships between individuals because society is made up from those building blocks, if you like, of individuals and all their relationships. And where the relationships are not there, then society doesn't gel together. And it's only if you, very simple thing, say hello to your neighbour, greet them when they're having their particular festivals of their religion or culture, and look outside your own um, experience, your own identity, and meet people. Then it can begin to grow. So... It was, it was artificial, it was an experiment, and we can't all replicate that. But in some, in some ways, I think we do need to do that. We do need to invite people of different cultures, faiths, ethnicities into our own homes. I've had a couple of imams in my home, for example, so unlike most white kids, my, my sons can say, we've had an imam in, in our house, and that's, that's different. And... We can go from there. Wouldn't it have been great to have seen a politician on that programme? And wouldn't that challenge the kind of things that we hear from some of our politicians about multiculturalism and how multiculturalism isn't working? Uh, Zulfi, um, I mean, I think, you know, Julian and you have made the point that, you know, there's an element of personal interaction here, and I don't think that anybody would, would deny that. But... Um, but isn't there perhaps a case that how likely you are to say hello to your neighbour rather than abuse your neighbour is partly resulted a result of whether or not you've got a job, whether or not you feel confident of paying the rent, whether or not your kids are doing well at school. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a level of social strain in the society which kind of precedes individual interaction or shapes individual interaction, and that's, that's the element that the programme doesn't touch. Uh, yes, obviously the economics are absolutely fundamental to any community and no matter what culture or religion you are, um, you know, the basic human needs as far as, you know, housing and, and, and putting food on the table for your family is absolutely, uh, you know, number one. Um, but also alongside that is how you interact with other people. And I think some of the issues that we have is if we have a look at the some. The, the estate in Bradford where this particular program was was filmed and, and the Asian community where they were from in the city, you actually don't get interactions. You don't have a white neighbour next to a, a Pakistani family or an Asian family and vice versa if you go into the white um, sort of uh, housing estates. You don't have a Pakistani or a black or an Asian family there. So you, you are completely isolated. And where is the, the interaction? And I think what's very fundamental is religion, because I think Christianity, when it was popular and the way it should be, when people had religion, they were more tolerant and imams would visit a a church and the rest of it. The young people now have lost faith. There is no religion and there is no middle ground. What is the middle ground now? What's the communal place where we all meet? Um, it's, it's Facebook and Twitter. It's not in a mosque and it's not in a church. And it's definitely not, you know, as a, a, or a street party where we may have had once upon a time to celebrate, you know, a, a jubilee or the coming home of, or, you know, the, the, the reign of the queen or whatever it may well be. So, do we give people the platform to interact? And could it all be down to money? I don't think so. Mm. Do, you think, do you think that's true, to, or do you think that's a slightly golden age argument that it was better in the past, whereas, I mean, you know, perhaps many, many Jews living in the East End in the uh, 1880s would have said, 
well, I don't know, coronation maybe, but isn't so good around here. I think if we look in our history, we see successive waves of immigrants being made unwelcome or made to feel unwelcome and the, the rest of society not wanting to integrate with them. So I see it going back and back and we all need to challenge that and we can look at our history and we can see how the Jews were expelled from this country. We can look at the treatment of Catholics 150 or 200 years ago and see that they weren't made to feel welcome and even people who were living in this country but their religion wasn't seen as quite right, they were made to feel unwelcome as well. So we all need to work on that and learn from our history and not perpetuate it and challenge the things that the, the far right are saying about um, nationhood and society and the Christian Muslim Forum, like Bradford Council of Mosques, creates opportunities for Christians and Muslims to meet locally and regionally so we can build friendships, so we can get to know each other and so we can get across those hurdles. Mm. Well, that's an interesting point you make about the, about the far right because also, I mean, absent is any notion that there might be some people in the society who are stirring this up. Uh, and they might not just be the far right, they might be some mainstream politicians who are doing this as well. So it, it, there's a sense in which it, it uh, institutionalises the problem amongst ordinary people, whereas actually there's a political problem here as well. Mm. There is, and every now and then, especially around the election time, our politicians, some of them, to some degree or other, will flag up these issues and use it to promote themselves by talking about immigration and I think politicians need to be more careful about the temperature of society and the kinds of attitudes that they are putting across and that they're encouraging others to share with and if they want to talk about integration then they need to model it themselves and be very careful in what they say. Well, uh, Julian Bond and Zulfi Karim, thank you both for participating in that discussion. Thank you for watching and please do join us uh, for the next edition of the Politics and Media Show.